Well, good afternoon, uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed lunch and that you had some valuable networking. Our next uh, speaker is Mr. Ashish Sakar, and just before I introduce him, may I just say that um, last Wednesday, Ashish was one of the most inspiring speakers that we had at my Business Council for Africa's annual debate, which some of you may have attended. I did not have the opportunity that day to speak to Ashish, but I was in the audience and I have to tell you all that Ashish's address was absolutely fantastic. Ashish, you spoke with such passion, such knowledge and such understanding of Africa's opportunities and challenges. And the end result was that the audience were so motivated, they were raring to go. And in fact, I was expecting a mass exit to the nearest airline booking office <laughs> to, to book uh, air tickets to Africa. And I know, Ashish, that you're going to have that same electrifying effect on this audience today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Ashish Thakar is the executive chairman of Mara Sakoni an African e-commerce platform with a focus on B2C marketplace for general merchandise. He's also the founder of Mara Group and Mara Foundation. Ashish has driven the growth of the Mara Group from a small IT business in Uganda to the globally recognized multi-sector investment group that exists today. Through its investments, Mara Group now employs over 11,000 people across 25 African countries in sectors spanning technology, banking, real estate, and infrastructure. Ashish serves as the chair of the United Nations Foundation Global Entrepreneurship Council and is the author of The Lion Awakes, Adventures in Africa's Economic Miracle. Ashish, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, guys. Um, thank you, Clive, I think the, uh, please lower your expectations right now. <laughs> um, as you can see, I went through a lot of effort dressing up for you all. Um, so my name is Ashish J. Thacker. Um, I was a refugee. I'm a school dropout, an, an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, and a to-be astronaut. Um, <laughs> I'll give you a quick background, and I apologize to some of you who this may seem a little repetitive if you've heard it before. But my father's family moved to Uganda in 1890. My mother's family moved to Tanzania in 1920, purely looking for trading opportunities. In 1972, um, after they got married, they lived in Kenya, Rwanda, and they moved back to Uganda. And in 1972, the unfortunate incident of Idi Amin took place. So my parents got kicked out of Uganda, lost everything, and moved to England. My father worked in the Ford factory in England. My mother worked in the Walker's Crisp factory. Hence, I love them. Um, and they built a little bit of capital, set up a small business, built some more capital, bought a home. But in 93, they were just missing home, missing Africa. So we sold our home and business here in England, and we moved to Rwanda. Nine months later, unfortunately, the genocide broke out. My parents, my sister, and I were refugees for 35 of the 100 days. We were at home for nine days, and then we went to Hotel de Mis Collines, which is famously known as the Hotel Rwanda. How many of you have seen the movie Hotel Rwanda? So we, we were there for nine days, and then we were taken to the uh, Ecole Francaise, and, um, and then the airport, and evacuated to Bujumbura in Burundi, which had a similar issue. But luckily, you know, cutting a long story short, luckily we came out alive, but unfortunately everything we built from 72 to 93, we lost in 94. And it was, it was unbelievable because um, we, we kind of take this for granted now, but communication at that time just didn't work as well as it does today. So my sister, Rona, who heads the uh, Mara Foundation, who was supposed to be here today, and unfortunately couldn't make it. Um, she was in England at the time with my grandmother and, and other relatives, and they only found out we're okay two and a half weeks into the genocide when they saw us in the background on CNN. So you can kind of imagine how communications has changed so drastically. <coughs> so anyway, we went back to Uganda. You know, I'm, I'm at an age, I can understand what's happening, I can see what my family's gone through, 
I can see people avoiding my parents, scared that if my parents come too close, they may ask for a favor. And as a result, I felt like I wanted to and needed to do something about it. So I quit school at the age of 15, so I am officially the most uneducated person in this room. Um, and I took a $5,000 loan and set up a little IT business. I was buying goods in Dubai, motherboards, hard drives, processors, flying back to Uganda, selling them Monday to Friday, getting the cash, going back. Did that every weekend for four months. And finally went to my supplier the 15th time and said, listen, you know, you know me, I know you, can I, you know, get some credit? And he said, you're from Africa, right? And I was like, yes. And he's like, no, you're not getting any credit. <laughs> And this was in 96 when, you know, the perception of our continent um, was even worse than it is today. So the only way I could solve this was by actually setting up a company in Dubai and becoming a Dubai company. I started getting credit, realized so many people from across the continent had the same challenge. So as a result, in 96, 97, I started extensively traveling across the continent. Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, Tanzania, DRC, Ethiopia, Zambia, Mozambique, Malawi, South Africa. And very quickly realized that every single one of our countries has such unique history. We've all got our own histories and cultures and politics and parliaments. So how do you truly operate in a true local manner, but with global standards? And that became the Mara model. So to fast track to today, uh, Mara is gonna turn 20 years old in August, so it's a big year for us. Um, we now have four businesses that we're focused on. We're headquartered out of Dubai, but we're in 25 African countries, and we're an African group. The four businesses are uh, banking is the first one, which uh, my partner, Bob Diamond, who used to run Barclays globally, and I set up in late 2013. We listed on the London Stock Exchange. We now have banks in seven countries across the continent. We've got a two and a half billion dollar balance sheet. We've got a phenomenal team. And the whole idea behind banking and financial services, I mean, I was an SME on the receiving end of financial services on our continent. And the traditional banking model was that banks would take in customers' deposits, put it into government treasuries, make a 1,000 to 1,200 basis point spread. So why would they lend to SMEs? Why would they lend to businesses? And it was very frustrating as an SME coming up that we truly do need a real bank for business on our continent. And at the same time, a bank that's gonna be a little disruptive, taking advantage of mobile telephony, the fact that mobile money was created on our continent, but today is still telecom operator led. How do you change this narrative and make it mobile banking and not mobile money? And how do you make it financial institution led and not telecom operator led? So as Atlas Mara, we're very excited. Um, in six of the countries, we have a, a controlling stake and in, Nigeria, we are, we're the single largest shareholder of Union Bank in Nigeria. So that's the Atlas Mara uh, business. The second business is real estate. Uh, we have a company called Mara Delta Property Holdings. It is listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. It's roughly a half a billion dollar asset base. We've got assets across eight countries in Africa, building and owning shopping malls and office towers uh, in quite a few different countries, and again, one of those thought processes and mindsets that how do we kind of up the level of quality of our developments locally to an, the next level? The fact that there's a shortage in the market doesn't give us an excuse to create shoddy developments or cut corners and think that there's no choice so people will use it. Our people understand and appreciate quality and global standards and therefore that's what we aim to provide. The third business, is um, our infrastructure business, which we're gonna be announcing in the next few weeks, and I've been warned I'm not allowed to talk about it, but as we're amongst family, <laughs> uh, it's a partnership with GE, and it's gonna be the first of its kind for them and us, uh, which we're gonna be announcing, hopefully, uh, in the next few weeks in Lusaka. So that's gonna be our power generation and infrastructure investment company across the continent. And lastly, it's our technology vertical, which is e-commerce, which is Mara Shopping, it's Last Mile Logistics, which is Mara Express, and we're looking at an entire digital and technology strategy on how can we take things to the next level. Seven years ago, we set up the Mara Foundation. Being a 15-year-old entrepreneur, starting with no ability to network, no ability to raise capital, I understand what it's like firsthand being in that position. 
And therefore, we set up the Mara Foundation to focus on truly enabling, empowering, and inspiring young entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs across our continent. We set up the mentorship program, which is Mara Mentor, which is available on every app store, and I encourage you to download it. And it basically gives guidance, advice, hand-holding, support. And our thesis has been that our education system doesn't provide entrepreneurial know-how, et cetera, and informal education in form of mentorship is so important in the peer-to-peer -peer conversations. So I'm really pleased to say that today we have roughly 850,000 entrepreneurs across our continent active on Mara Mentor. And the best part is through my new role at the United Nations Foundation's Global Entrepreneurs Council, we're gonna be taking this globally. So typically we're used to global initiatives coming to Africa. This is an African initiative going global. The three themes that we run with as Mara have been firstly, you know, creating the best of global, getting the best of global and combining it with the best of local. There's no point of reinventing the wheel. Let's learn how other people have done it, but let's do it better. The second thing is being extremely institutional. Having the right framework of governance, et cetera, is very important, but not losing the entrepreneurial edge that you should have in terms of making things a success. And lastly, and probably most importantly, is do good, and you will do well. Too many people promise to do good after they've done well, never get around to it. And I, we have a firm philosophy that if you're gonna give back, mean it, do it for the right reason. Create an impact, make a difference, and change people's lives. I've been very lucky, I have a spiritual leader, his name is Murari Bapu, and his teaching is truth, love, and compassion. Simple words, but a very, very powerful force, and I think, that's how we need to start changing the way we think and do things. I mean, you know, there's a ridiculous and untrue title given to me by some media houses and all related to wealth and how success should be defined by wealth. And I am totally against that. Success should not be measured by wealth. It should be measured by the lives you're changing, by the difference you're making. That should be the measurement of success. And that's what we need to make happen. But bottom line, as a continent, I mean, being active on the continent for 20 years, doing business across the continent for the last two decades, seeing that our governance is improving. We're only answerable to ourselves. We're not answerable to anybody else. But we have to start telling our own story. We have to start changing the narrative. And it frustrates me and really upsets me that we're so misunderstood in so many different ways still, despite the fact that we are trying to tell our story, we're clearly not doing a good job of it. Look at the Nigeria elections as a perfect example. Everybody expected a different outcome. Yet, we had a peaceful, free, and fair democratic election. But guess what? It wasn't talked about. Do you know why? Because it was peaceful, free, and fair. <laughs> Ebola is another perfect example. People canceled their Christmas holidays to Kenya and South Africa and ended up coming here in London. Yet, London is closer to the Ebola epicenter than Kenya and South Africa. It's all these kind of contradictions which really frustrate us. Kenya, and this is the biggest one that I'm still, I haven't figured out, but Kenya sent troops to Somalia to fight global terrorism. And as a result, they retaliated and a shopping mall got attacked in Kenya. Immediately, the world put a travel ban, don't travel to Kenya alert up from every country. France had a similar issue and the entire world flew there, walked on the streets, and stood in solidarity. So does that mean that there's a difference? Does that mean that our lives are valued according to our GDPs of our countries? No, no, we've got to change this, and only we are responsible. We can't blame anyone else, we can't criticize anybody else. We have to change this. So guys, it's all about changing the narrative. I think you know, we've heard a lot about you know, how do we bring Silicon Valley to Africa and create the Silicon Savannas, et cetera, and I think it's awesome. But I'm more excited about how do we take Africa to Silicon Valley? How do we create initiatives locally that we can take away? So the challenge is really ours. Uh, it's ours to mess up. I think this is the most exciting time, despite the fact that commodity prices are down, 
currencies have had a challenge. IMF has degraded us. All of those things are there. But I think that makes the bigger opportunity. We have never been a short-term investment destination, never. Our continent is a medium to long-term investment destination, and that's what we need to stay focused on. We should not lose focus. And actually, this year more than ever, and next year, we're gonna go even more aggressive. I mean, as cheesy as it sounds, we've been in existence for 20 years, but I really do think Mara is just getting started. What we've done for the last 20 years has been preparing us for what we're gonna do going forward. And I think that needs to apply to all of us in terms of thinking, mindset, and approach. But enough of the talk, enough of the conversation, it's now time for action. And no pressure, it's really on you guys. And we need to do this together. And you know, lastly, just to sum up, um, somebody, somebody asked me recently, you know, when you, when you think about Africa, do you, do you see the glass half full or do you see it half empty? And I got a little confused by this. And I was like, look, if I tell you it's half empty, you're gonna knock it down and empty it quicker. If I tell you it's half full, you're not gonna help me fill it. This is our story. We're gonna fill it, we're gonna overflow it, we're gonna take it to the next level. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Ashish, thank you very much. And I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen, you'll agree with me that Ashish's story is so inspiring, so motivating, so passionate. It's absolutely an amazing story, heartwarming. And I think, uh, Ashish, correct me if I'm wrong, but the real punchline you gave us, which is something for us to take away and think about, is that success is not about building personal wealth. It's much more to be measured by the lives that you change for the better. I think that's a wonderful... Uh, thing for us to take away from what you said. But I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen, you have some questions for Ashish. Uh, we're somewhat limited on time, but we'll see how far we can go. And I ask for the first question, sir. Just go going back to the initial uh, stage you set up the company, you had a reason to set up the company in Dubai. Uh, you trading 20 years old. Is there any reason to keep the headquarters in Dubai or um, I mean, is there any plan to bring it back to Africa? It's a very good question. Do, would you like me to answer? Or would you please, no, please go ahead. Um, it's a great question. And you know, when you think about Dubai as a hub for the continent, I mean, it, it's extremely convenient, firstly, in terms of migration laws. I can get any of our uh, nationalities across the continent into the head office within 72 hours. I'm on the Global Agenda Council for Africa for the World Economic Forum, and we're really changing, we're, we're working on this migration pact, the fact that it's easy, it's easier to be a British citizen or an American citizen to travel across our continent than it is a fellow African, which is ridiculous. So we're changing this. We've created a very nice um, infographic. If you don't have it, I'll send it to the organizers so they can circulate it. But it shows and names and shames the countries that haven't been complying with this as much as they should. Um, because we need to start creating visas on arrival for, for fellow Africans. So that's one big advantage. And I, I'm a big believer that you know, being in Kenya doesn't make it any easier or enable you to understand Uganda better. I mean, you've got to be in each country. So when people ask me, where, where's your regional office on the continent? It's in 25 countries. We're local in every country. And as an African group that invests nowhere but Africa, <laughs> I, you know, I'm absolutely comfortable being in Dubai because it connects the continent very well to Asia, Europe, and the US. Uh, so for now, it is, a, it is a phenomenal hub for that. Another question, sir. Um, um, <laughs> what, what, what are you doing to support your supply chain? I mean, now that you're in a position where you're, you're quite a large company on your, in yourself, you obviously have a lot of good uh, African companies that are um, growing and they're suppliers to you. Some of these companies could actually end up in Silicon Valley. Do you have a program to actually support that infrastructure? Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely, it's a good question. I think on one hand, you know, we, we obviously have the mentorship program, which is really trying to, trying to help. I mean, the next plan and phase is access to capital, which is enabling debt uh, from banks, uh, but also on the equity side. 
I think as an overall organization, the last mile logistics business is gonna be going very deep root to enable, I mean, the whole point of the e-commerce business is to enable global brands to plug in and sell locally in our market. But there's a flip side to this, which I'm really excited about, which is a smaller market which will grow, and it kind of touches on your point, which is the whole local brands going national, regional, and global. And I think enabling that is gonna be a crucial point. We're launching our last mile logistics business in Nigeria and South Africa. Uh, to kick off, and then we expect to take it to other parts of the continent. I think we should allow the ladies to ask a few <laughs> questions. Is there a lady? <laughs> yes. Hi. You said something about infrastructure starting up, but you can't really talk about it. If I wanted to know more, or if I wanted to just understand more, how can I do that? Um, read the newspapers on May 26th. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hopefully by end of May is when we're going to be doing uh, the, the official announcement. So you hope to see it. Sir. We've got a single European Sky Initiative, which means that different countries uh, standardise and use uh, the best approach of technology for air traffic control, which in the future could mean a virtual air traffic control centre, which means you would own techni technically we can do this. So Africa could take some of these great ideas, if the political will was there, to enable uh, air traffic control infrastructure, for example which would be safer, very cost effective. We can leapfrog some of the ways that uh, have been carried out in Europe. And I just wonder if, if transport infrastructure is something that you're involved in or looking at. Yeah, it's a part of the, the remit. I think governments are motivated to make a difference. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that constantly. So if there is a practical idea, governments do adopt to it. I mean, I think, you know, sometimes we, we discount um, how amazing some of our governments and regulators have been. Mobile money would not be working across our continent if it wasn't for regulators enabling it to work. Uh, in a lot of other emerging markets, it's still not legal or it's still not functioning because the governments haven't enabled it. So I think our governments are of a mindset that they do want to uh, make that difference, but in our infrastructure business, to specifically answer, transportation is a part of the overall remit because uh, obviously GE is very large in that space as well. Thank you, Ashish. One more question. Yes, madam at the back there. Hi, I'm Peggy Jean-Louis, uh, LSE Business Partnership Manager. Uh, I had a question, since we are at a university and we're talking about business, how could academics and researchers help dr African entrepreneurs drive their business further and growth? Um, encourage them to quit school earlier. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 no, I, I, I told you I'm the worst advocate for education. No, I'm, I'm only kidding. I think it's absolutely crucial and important. Um, I think there's a, there's a huge role. You know, we need to think about, I mean, I, I, what I'm excited about, particularly on our continent, and again, you know, we kind of get carried away sometimes thinking about what it is today versus what it's going to be in the next five, ten years. The fact that as Africa, we have you know, maybe 800 million mobile phone subscribers. But today we only have 150 million smartphones. Within the next five years, four or five years, we're gonna have 700 million smartphones. I want you guys to really imagine this. I mean, 700 million smartphones across the continent, the way healthcare, the way trade will be conducted, the way financial services, investments, etc. But that's where education, and I think academia needs to start, you know, it would be great to start thinking forward in terms of how we can use that technology platform to really take things, you know, help things and enable things to the masses. See, I'm, I'm also a big believer, and that's why Mara Foundation, it is low touch. You know, 850,000 entrepreneurs is not a small number, but it's not like we're able to take each one. I mean, it's very challenging, so it is low touch. But it's scalable and it's self-sustainable. And the fact that our continent is growing at the pace it is, the more babies born in Nigeria last year than the whole of Western Europe, the fact that our population growth <laughs> is so high, we have to find scalable, 
self-sustainable solutions. Uh, so make more babies. <laughs> Please, ma'am, make this the last one, if you would. Yes. One final question from a lady at the front here. Hello, my name is Elizabeth. My question is, um, being a, when you want to invest in Africa, being a small to medium-sized business or an entrepreneur, what advice would you give? Because the infrastructure is going to be very um, demotivating when you get there, especially if you live in Europe or the USA. What advice would you give to not give up and just keep going when like communication or like infrastructures gets or government policies just get in the way or stop you? What what's kept you going? Especially since you lived here and then moved back and it must have been very frustrating for you initially. See it's it's a brilliant question. I'm really glad you touched on this because I think it, it really boils down to the fact that firstly that problem or issue is not only for you, it's for the entire market. So firstly, everyone's got that same issue, right? Which creates that level playing field in that sense. Secondly, again, maybe I'm just overly optimistic, but I think that presents an opportunity. Uganda was, is landlocked, and therefore an infrastructure in terms of the ports at that time were even a lot, a lot less efficient than they are today. Very expensive to import goods. It was cheaper to import things from China to Kenya than Kenya to Uganda, right? So, so very expensive due to the infrastructure issue. So what did we do? We found a product that we could manufacture locally that was high volume but low value. And if it's high volume and low value, that means the percentage of freight is gonna be so high on that product that it's too expensive to import if there's local manufacturing taking place. So we created that plant. Um, I started that business when I was 19, I think. And you know, we became the largest corrugated packaging manufacturer in East and Central Africa. And we just recently sold that business. But that was a massive market which we tapped into and the imports were coming from Italy and Brazil before we started. But due to the infrastructure challenges, that presented a massive opportunity that you could tap into. So I think it's a matter of looking through it. And our infrastructure isn't gonna stay like this forever. It's moving, it's evolving, it's changing, right? It will take some time. Um, and if I can just sum up on that note is, you know, somebody, we've always seen that India is compared to China in terms of developing markets. Africa is compared to India in a lot of cases. So someone asked me, they're like, you know, is Africa eight or 10 years behind India? And so I said, look, let's break it down. In terms of infrastructure, maybe. In terms of telecom, we're probably a year behind. In terms of financial services, in terms of regulator, et cetera, we're probably one and a half to two years ahead. In terms of e-commerce, we're probably three years behind. So the point is when you start breaking down these factors, it then really shows you that we've been able to leapfrog and progress in some things quicker than others. But again, all these issues, firstly, are for the entire market, and secondly, present huge opportunities. Ashish, thank you very much indeed. Your story truly was so inspirational.